Welcome to the, um, the June installment of the Forge Modeling Simulation Community Meeting. Um, I'll ask those of you that are here, if you have a question, you could raise your hand or post it in the chat. Um, I won't be watching it that close until I stop sharing my slides or stop sharing my screen, but um, lots of good information to pass along today. So with, without further ado, so agenda for today, uh, primarily three main things to talk about is uh, an update um, from the field. I say field schedule, I should just say field update. We'll talk about some slug testing that we conducted in well 16A. And then the last part of this, we'll kind of go over some more finalized planning for the well connection, the confirmatory testing. So um, those are the three main things. We're open to talk about other things as well as the, the, uh, as the uh, conversation evolves. So um, field update, Joe, I made some slides here, but Joe, we, Joe is luckily we have Joe on today. So Joe, if you want to give an update, um, I pulled the, the best I can. Let me talk about some of the monitoring system. Then you could talk about the drilling for 16B, if you would. Does that sound good? Fine. Okay. Fine. So we did procure, as I mentioned, our last meeting two months ago, a monitoring system for the offset wells, as well as 16A and 16B. That system has been installed. We are fine tuning the sensors and the programming right now. Our preliminary schedule has a live data feed. Um, getting ready to come off that here sometime next week. So we're finalizing some little bit of things and still need to swap a few sensor wires around, but um, should be by late next week um, that we'll be online. If nothing else, when we get back down before we conduct the well flow tests, um, we will have this stuff online. So we'll, we'll make an announcement when that's ready and um, it'll just be through the Forge social media channels or other venues that the communication team deem fit. Um, I, did, I mentioned we did some slug tests in well 16A. So we did three of these tests and essentially uh, the results suggest, and I'll get into this in more detail as we get further along, but the um, results suggest that the stimulation activities created significant permeability. And when I say significant permeability, um, the results we analyze actually we get transmissivity, um, but our estimate between the three tests comes in approximately 10 to the minus five meters squared per second. That's actually, I would say a pretty good result. Um, we'll find a whole lot more about these things. And I'll talk more about those um, here in a few minutes. Joe, 16B, I guess, has been drilled the TD at 10,947 feet measured. Um, I believe they're reaming and court conditioning the hole now. Uh, Joe, do you want to say, I have another slide for this, if you, and then, uh, but if you have anything you want to say before I, uh, I'll let you take over, actually, because you're the one that's been in charge of all this. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that that that's correct. We've um, TD'd at, at 10, 947, which is about 460 feet from our boundary. And that's based on oil and gas regulations. There are no geothermal regulations in terms of boundaries in, in Utah. Um, we have completed a logging run. Logs um, went to 10,000. 727 uh, feet uh, was the bottom of the logs. And, and that's a full suite of logs, FMI log. Um, and I think UBI log was, was also done. Um, so good, good suite of logs. Um, try to run a caliper log and, and going to have to run F use the, the arms on the FMI log uh, for, for that. Um, uh, let's see, we also tried to run a, a temperature uh, tool um, on a bogey, on a basic, basically on a skateboard, got to about 9,400 feet and uh, wouldn't go any further on its own. Uh, the hole was a little enlarged at that, at that depth. Um, in terms of schedule, we, uh, we are reaming at, uh, at this point and um, once the reaming is done, Battelle will will do their um, mini frac tests. They have up to ten days of mini frac tests that they can do, um, with uh, restrictions on, on that. Um, so I'm expecting at least a few days, and um, possibly up to ten days for them to do these tests. They'll they'll do one in the vertical section down to about six thousand. And then they'll do some in, in the tangent. Um, we have recovered a significant amount of core, uh, about 160 feet, I think, at this point. 
um, give or take a, a few feet. I'm pleased about that. The the core is dominantly um, metamorphic, nisic with um, with interfingering uh, granitic rocks. And if you remember, as we we move down into the 16A, we see more nisic rocks. These are high grade nices, one point seven billion years old. They have silimanite in them. So, so we're interested to see what, what we get there. After the Battelle tests, they'll probably do a little more cleanup, and then there'll be a short um, circulation test with the entire hole open. What is this, six to eight hours now, Rob? Yeah, well, yeah it'll probably a little bit longer than that, but um, yeah. We're, 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 I'll, I'll talk more about that here, but I have slides for that, Joe. But. Okay, uh, just, to, just to put the schedule in perspective, once that uh, interwell test is done, we will go in and uh, case and run fiber. And that will be, well, it's going to be where the original <laughs> TD was because I don't think we have more casing. So that would have been 10-1, I, I think is the, is the depth. We are um, that depth to um, casing shoe. Um, we are at last uh, survey about 11 feet high and 70 feet to the north. So good directional control on the well. Uh, once the casing is, is uh, landed and cemented, there'll be a interwell flow test with, um, with the fibers being monitored for those that haven't followed. There'll be three fibers. There'll be a silica fiber that rice will uh, will run. There'll be um, a flat pack that uh, UT Austin will be running. They'll be run parallel um, on the same centralizers and clamps. And then there'll be a third fiber optic that'll come from the heel for um, pressure gauge. Um, and you know we're looking forward to seeing data from all of them. Um, Colin, yeah, it, it's a complete list. I can get you uh, a list of the logs that were run already. Um, and they are still, a lot of them still in the interpretational stage um, that, that Schlumberger is providing, um, but, but it is really a complete suite of logs. Um, I think that was, unless there are questions, um, we have, what else? We have a separator on site. You'll talk more about the, the sampling. Will your gauge be optic? Um, the, this is the pressure gauge you're looking at. It's, it's going, the, the fiber is, I can have Jonathan answer, but we have DAS, D, D T S and D S S with strain meters as well. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no. Okay. So, Rob, if you want, if if unless there are other questions, Stephen I'll just... followed up with this question about the pressure gauge. Is that optic or electronic? That is for pressure. Yeah, optic, I believe. Okay. All right. Um, one question I have, Joe, it's like you did mention where the where the casing will finally be set. What was that depth again? Because I know we I think it was 10-1. We had originally planned to TD at uh 10697. And it was going to be 500 feet of an open hole. Okay. And so I think we're looking at 10-1. Jonathan, who is on the call, um was shorted a bit on his cable. So um, <laughs> we're not, we won't go to to full casing shoe on, okay. on the cables. Okay, thank you for that. And I think from based on like just memory that that ten one will essentially it will cement and case in the second or the 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 third stimulation zone in that we did an A. So what that will be behind casing when the um, uh, after that casing is set. So we will be able to see. Some response there. Well, when those if there's fractures there that connect, so that's good to know. Mm -hmm. Two of these zones will be open. 
So there, I, we, we got one more question. I don't know the answer. Um, that all, all three fibers will be cemented in, in the um, annulus of the seven inch casing. Um, and uh, in case the question comes up, the cores were taken where, um, where we anticipated the stimulated fractures to encounter 16B. Okay, I'll take over now. If there's other further questions for Joe, you can keep them coming. Um, if not, I will kind of, we'll move on. So, so the slug tests. So what am I talking about here? Essentially, what we did was we just simply filled up well 16A with water to the top of casing and observed the decline in the water level um, over time. We tried originally doing this with just uh, expecting 16 to be really tight. Um, Clay Jones and I tried doing this with just several five gallon buckets of water to try to raise it a few feet. Um, that test really didn't seem to work well. So then we came back in with a water truck and filled hundreds of feet uh, of water um, to the top of the well and then actually had to use data sets. Um, I will say that when we filled these things up, it, it took more volume of water than just a casing volume to fill it. So the well was taking water as we went and we didn't have, it was just a, a pump line out of the water truck. So we don't have a, we didn't measure the volume of water as we pumped it into the well. So the best we could have is once the well was filled and move it down. So that volume we know. So if you're in a true sense of a, a, of a slug test, these, these are not truly slug tests, but they're close. Um, we did three of these tests where we actually filled it to the very top of the casing and obtained similar results. And I'd say this work was done in, in very close coordination and actually at the recommendation of uh, Peter Meyer at Geoenergy Swiss. Um, many thanks to Peter and his team. They did much most of the analysis on these data sets. Um, and I'm going to show some of those results uh, right now. So this essentially is what it looks like. Um, what you're seeing here in black is a pressure. It's absolute pressure in, in, uh, in PSI. Um, so it essentially is pressure or height of water above the measurement point. We use an airline to measure this hook to a pressure transducer. The red curve here is just air temperature or temperature at the site. Um, yeah, uh, I'll answer some of those questions as I go. It's, it's a good idea. So the um, um, we did see a little bit of noise here and then when the temperatures got to be above about 25 degrees C, um, but that seems to be going down. We worked on some of the data systems a lot. So the question about, um, Use an echo meter to read the rate of fluid drop. No, we, we measured absolute pressure. Um, echo meters proved to be unreliable, uh, even measuring water level though. between going through the whole tree and there's some a bit of dirt and grease and muck in these wells. Um, so we had very, very little success with the echo meters. So um, in all these wells that we actually have absolute pressure gauges um, or pressure gauges down hole or airlines not hold or measuring the, the, the pressure effect itself, not the level. So here's the same, um, the same data set, the same pressure, absolute pressure in black, um, all, but showing top across with blue and barometric pressure. Um, we didn't see a, a very strong correlation between barometric pressure changes and, uh, and the, uh, the absolute data. Um, Question, your fluid levels were not shot for additional data like we do in oil and gas wells. Yeah, we tried. Um, we didn't have very good, good success with, with getting those levels. Um, and we didn't have an E-line like, to do direct measurements on site. Um, so no, we don't have the absolute level in there once again. But we do have relative changes um, in, 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 all the, in, in the well. So the relative to the start of the test, we filled it up and then it declined. So here actually is analysis using Cooper uh, Breedhoff Papadopoulos method. And essentially what you do is looking at essentially the normalized drawdown versus time, all both of the you know, times on a log scale. The, um, the data are in black, the collected data, and an interpretation or a fit to that um, analytical model is in red. What you'll see here at the early time, we get a fairly decent match. But as we get to later times, the flow deviates from the analytical solution. Um, we actually saw this in, in all of the tests where we see this, I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer very well, but we see this deviation um, through mid, mid to late time 
So in those cases, we didn't really get you know good data in there that makes it a little bit harder to get for the fit. But um, what you're seeing from this first test was the first time we tried it. The inferred um, transmissivity, this is a transmissivity measure, not a permeability, but it came out the order of, of 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus six meters squared per second. Um, that actually is, um, is, is I, I would think, fairly high for what we expected, at least from my interpretation or my expectation before we did this, I thought that number would be a lot lower. So I'm going to move on here. Um, this actually was, look, so this is a cleaning up that data set, removing that late time data where it deviated. And only looking at the thing earlier, we see a much better fit here for that part of it. Um, which comes out with that result of about one times 10 to the minus five meters squared um, per second. Now, there's a whole bunch that goes into this analysis. And I'm not going to get into it um, in a whole lot of detail, but I just want to kind of highlight the next two tests that we did. So um, now that we have the data system online and I can actually, we can actually look at this remotely. Um, so as the well equilibrated, we reached out to the field team and had them refill the well multiple times. So we could do some confirmatory testing. So what you're seeing here are the two additional tests. So what you're seeing is from this baseline of absolute pressure, um, a rise of, of, on the order of about 40 or 50 PSI, um, and then a slow decline, and then the decline, which is very rapid at first, and then you know slowly declines down over time. Did the same test again um, and, and watched it decline. Um, shown here again in is red is in temperature. I'm not doing any corrections for the um, um, for any, for any temperature effects or, or barometric pressure effects. Question, take the fill the well to top of each case. It, it took 10, between 10 and 20 minutes. Um, so it um, it was it was taking a lot of water. We can only pump it in so fast because we get air locks. So between trying to vent the well and pump it with the truck, it, it, it was not a precise test. It was impromptu. So I'll say that. Um, the interval thickness, um, Eric, essentially, we have 200 feet of open hole and we have two 20 foot thick perforated zones. Now, is that a true effective thickness? No. Um, you know, our interpretation, we have several fractures in each of those zones that take the fluid. So we're talking transmissivity. I've been avoiding effective permeability. I'll get to that in a second though, Eric, and I'll let you come online and speak if you like to, um, uh, to comment about it. So these are essentially the results of those same, uh, of those last two tests. And what you, actually, no, this is the first one of the two. I won't show them all, but um, essentially what I wanted to highlight is we, we still see the same behavior that comes at a little bit later time. Um, and, and correcting for that, essentially, um, the first test there, kind of as a summary, the first test there in reds, we tried to do it with, which with the five gallon buckets, um, didn't work out well at all. But you see the test two, three A, three B, we get pretty similar results um, for both transitivity and storativity. And the best interpretation of this is transitivity on order of one times 10 to the minus five, storativity about one times 10 to the minus six. So um, I'll leave, I think this is where I'll leave this one here and start talking about other things. But um, we're pretty happy with this and it actually helps us do some planning for the interwell flow testing that, uh, that I'm gonna talk about next. Any, any further questions about these data sets or these tests? I'm happy to even have just discussion if someone wants to come off mute or if you raise your hand, you can come off mute and uh, and and make some comments. Silence is uh, means move on. So 16A, 16B uh, connection testing or interwell flow testing. Now, last meeting we talked about we've had plans for two short-term flow testing campaigns to evaluate the connections between A and B immediately after drilling. Um, the first test is before casing is installed, as Joe mentioned. So um, where we're at right now is they're cleaning, reaming the hole. The Battelle team will come and do a bunch of, of, of mini frac or different tests throughout the interval. Um, after they're done, we're going to come and do the first test. Then the casing will be installed. We'll come in and do a second step test. And then after that, actually, we have planned for a longer term, a constant rate test. And I say longer term, it's still short term. It's on the order of 12 hours. But um, that's essentially we're constrained by the amount of volume of water we have for storage on the site. Um, we will be using a pump truck for this. Um, and um, uh, we'll, we'll use these tests to, to gain a whole lot more understanding. But these are preliminary tests. I'm going to stress this. These are not 
detailed long-term tests, um, but we're doing the best we can here to get some confirmatory information um, after these wells are drilled. So the first test, we talked about this last time, we made some changes here. Um, essentially here is the pumping schedule. Um, I believe it's Slumber J is doing the pumping. Sorry, I have, I have too many things open here. I'm gonna ignore a phone call. Um, Slumber, it'll be a Slumber J pump truck. If I'm wrong, someone from the operations team come and correct me. You're correct. Okay. So, um, and, and also to, to the further comment that we have, you know, we are actually contracted with Payson to, to monitor and collect data from all these systems. Plus we have the, the four dedicated systems that I mentioned earlier. So we'll be collecting these data streams from these wells um, on multiple systems. And some of this hopefully will be available in real time to the community to show, you know, to share. So the very first, um, the, the flow right here, this is similar to what I showed two months ago, but we made some minor changes here based on um, what we learned from the slug tests and from the drilling. So um, our initial pumping rate, we're gonna start at about half a barrel a minute. What we're trying to do there is mimic some of the, actually the, the pre-stimulation testing we did in well 16A was we did some low flow rate injections for a shear test, is what we called it, um, prior to all the stimulations. So our first stage, we're gonna to try to reproduce that to see what differences we see in, in the pressure history or the pressure, the observed pressure. Um, we will be maintaining back pressure on well 16B. Um, initially starting at keeping it as pressure ramps up, we're gonna hold it at 400 PSI before we allow any flow to, to leave um, 16B. But you see here the rates step up from half a barrel a minute to two and a half, five, uh, up to potentially up to as much as 10 barrels per minute. And all these essentially are um, conditional based upon whether or not we see, and I will say I'm calling acceptable injection pressures. We have some practical limits on the, the wellhead equipment as well as not wanting to do any additional stimulation. Um, the, the, the pressure that we're kind of hold back is um, looking at 500 PSI at 16B and anywhere between 35 and 5,000, 3,500 to 5,000 on 16A. So essentially we'll ramp up to a max rate and then step it back down. Um, we have approximately 2,000 barrels, 2,000 to 2,500 barrels of storage on site. And so use up pretty much all the water we have on site. We're still working through whether or not we'll have be able to do a, a flow meter test or a spinner test in the well at the conclusion of this, after we've cooled the well down, there's problems with getting equipment available on site. We are working to have some downhole logging, whether it's pressure, temperature, potentially flow rate um, in well 16A, um, dependent upon equipment availability. So there's no promises on, on, on any of the logging that's going on while injection is happening. But essentially this is the, 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 the first test we have planned right now in the plumbing schedule. Now, the second test is also planned as a step to step the flow rates, but we're doing a whole lot of iterations here between trying to manage all of the needs, expectations that we could do for the intervals or that we could do for all the interested parties here. Um, so right now, and I'm not gonna go into the details, but the second test, essentially, it will be intervals of injection and shut-in, looking at pressure interference testing, uh, more common in the oil and gas industry. Um, so we'll do an injection and shut-in for different periods of time and still step up the rates based on something similar to what I showed in the previous slide with a plan for primarily 16B to be shut in unless we need, unless you know we want to let off excess pressures um, throughout the test. And as I said earlier, there'd be a final test as a constant rate. Um, 16B is planned to be shut in for that test. So we can also, also look at pressure buildup through the reservoir, look for longer far reaching boundary effects, so to get some better idea of the effective size of, of our reservoir or of our fresher reservoir. Um, these rates, they're still in flux. I would say we're gonna finalize these after we get a better handle on what we see from the first test. Um, but we're still constrained by the amount of volume we have in storage at the site in the, in the frack tanks. So we're still gonna be holding around between 2000 and 2500 barrels, total injection for each of these two additional tests. So I'm going to show some quick model results for, and I'll show some that are done by Falcon. Um, and we'll also go to um, some results that were done by Exide. I see your question, Jeff. Um, I'll come back to you here um, in, in a second. So let me go through these. The, the short answer is we're, we want to avoid that if we can. So we're not trying to grow reservoir here. 
but we will need some, we have some pressure support to get flow to move. So um, we'll, we'll see where we're at here. This is the injection schedule or the, like for the, the Falcon model that my team here at INL have been using. Essentially, we, we did some well hydraulics and thermal hydraulics calculations between the, the open hole zone and the, the perforations where we expect to see the primary, the majority of flow based on just the pressure drop analysis. And so in our in, in the models I'm about to show, the majority of the flow, 80% goes into the open hole toe and each of the two perforated zones take 10% each. So what you're looking at here is essentially that breakdown in these different source zones. Source one in this model is the open hole, two and three are the two um, perforated zones. And so based on some of those slug tests and based on the earlier stimulation uh, shear testing uh, that was done before, we actually worked on some fits to try to match those data sets and come up with an initial permeability, initial fracture permeability, and, and also then that fresh permeability is pressure and temperature dependent. So what you're seeing here is based off of the initial fracture permeability of approximately 10 to the minus 16, um, you know, in the, in the what, tenth of a millidarcy range, which actually came to use that we fit as a, as a model match to the, the earlier stimulation tests and with a pretty strong pressure dependency to that, um, to the permeability. So in this case, we'll see a max, uh, the model suggests this is a, a delta P at, at the wellhead, a relative pressure of approximately 3,000 PSI at the wellhead. Um, so you're seeing that here on the right. So as we step through the rates, we see the pressure continually increasing. As the pressure increases, the permeability increases, um, which takes us to about 3,000 PSI, which would be below the frac pressure. Um, you'll see this actually in these different source zones, see different amounts of pressure changes. These are separated by quite a bit of distance vertically and also they get different amounts of fluid flow. So we will see there's a whole lot of inter, interaction that happens between those. Um, if we see a result at the um, production well, what I, what I didn't show was analysis from the stimulation. We did come up with a de discrete fracture model of the, um, of the production zone and where, that, where well 16B intersects with those fractures. And so in this model, we have four distinct zones where 16B is intersected by fractures. And so what you're seeing here at each one of those locations where the, the production well hits a fracture, you're seeing the pressure at those locations. And so what you're seeing here, essentially some of these pressures continually increasing. Um, but once we get some of these relative changes based on those back pressures, um, we essentially have some sink begin to ha start happening in these wells as the pressure builds up. Here is essentially the outflow rate over time. This is in kilograms per second. I apologize for uh, for the people who want to see gallons per minute. Uh, we actually, you know, this model works in, in units of mass, um, and I didn't convert it. But um, so what you're seeing here is, is a max outflow. In this case, approximating about 10 kilograms per second. And if I look at my three-handed conversion, that's about between about four barrels a minute um, at, at, at this at this rate. And this temperature here is temperature, sorry, temperature in the, as the flow enters the well, um, I have a, some thermal hydraulics that'll give us a temperature at the, at the surface for that. I won't talk about that right now. But um, so in this case, we're seeing here, you know, as I said, you know, coming about nine kilograms per second at, at the max and then slowly declining uh, through time. Yes, I can uh, loop, but I don't have it here with me. So um, the recovery here, I, I'll, 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 I can get that for you though. We could, I could do that. So I haven't even, it would be totally, you just talking out my rear. So I haven't even looked at that yet. I got these, these model results are just fresh from yesterday. Um, we will be putting fluid in storage in, in this scenario. I can tell you that for sure. Um, you know, and the other thing we have to talk about, you know, when we put in fluid in cold at 10 kilograms per second, and then uh, as that fluid heats up, you know, that volumetric expansion of the fluid can be as much as 20% uh, by changes in the density. So there's, there's a whole lot of things we need to work out. We go from volumetric to a, um, um, uh, to mass. Um, I'll just keep answering your questions here. Can you... Oh, because, because the model just shows fluid stopping. That's why for the, the question was, oh, Eric Sonical, um, can you explain why T is the production well? This is T of the produced fluid. So we turn essentially, essentially shut the well in so no fluid enters the well 
at um, at that time of uh, at 12 hours. So that's why it goes to zero because that's like the flowing enthalpy essentially what that is. Um, yes, the, it does include a method for leak off into the far field. So this is a fully coupled model. So we're simulating the reservoir and the fractures. So yes, the fluid here is moving into the bulk matrix. The fracture permeability, as I said, starts about 10 to the minus 16. The reservoir permeability in bulk uh, in this model is, is 10 to the minus 18 meters squared. Um, and in this model, we do not essentially have a pressure dependent permeability in the bulk matrix around it. So, but it does take fluid. As, in contrast here, this is the same, the same pumping scenario um, set, essentially starting with initial fresh permeability of 10 to the minus 13. And this comes back to Eric Sonnenthal's question about, you know, trying to get some effective um, service or effective area for flow to go into to go from a transmissivity to a permeability. Um, and this is a back of the envelope of, of, of what the permeability could be. I still think it's a little on the low side based on the amount of number of fractures we have. But um, this is the back of the envelope. We, we, we went with a 10 to the minus 13 using the same feedback formulation for the, the pressure dependent permeability. And so what you're seeing here is the same, the same injection scenario. But you know, at the injection well now, our max pressure only reaches approximately 700 or slightly above 800 delta P um, at the wellhead. So you know, I, I, um, then it's, it quickly declines after that, after flow is shut off. Um, at the production well, we, you know, we see a whole lot more, I would say, clean behavior where that, that fracture zone just opens up. We have a good, strong permeability between the two. And um, initially, we have the back pressure held at 400 PSI. Then we lower it to 200 PSI and we see the continuum to go from there. Um, so, oh, thanks, Eric. It, it, it does seem reasonable. I, I think it might be underestimated, but um, time will tell. Uh, importantly here, which I want to show is, you know, we look at the flow rate here now um, uh, with this using this higher permeability. We see our peak flow rate here comes out to be approximately almost 30 kilograms per second. This gets to your question. I think it was either Luke or Eric. Um, you know, we're inflating these the, the fracture zone by holding the back pressure up. We lower the pressure here from 400 psi back pressure to 200. We see essentially all that fluid that was held in storage in the fractures and, and also in the matrix around there quickly flow to, to move into the well and then you know spike up. So we still get a lot higher flow rate, a lot more volumetric recovery um, with the, uh, the higher permeability um, estimate. Which of these models uh, predictions are true? Um, time will tell, but I think we bracketed the behavior pretty well. I'm gonna to transition to some of the Excite model, the, the results. And this is a little bit different pumping scenario. As I said, we've been going through scenarios for essentially you know, the last three months. Um, I don't have that handy. The question is, can I show the, the injection flow rate with the production flow rate? That would be good information. I can prepare that um, and um, we could look at that as, as, as a cumulative. Yeah, that'd be really good to do. Um, as I said earlier, these are like last minute results. I finished these present this slides about 10 minutes before the presentation. Um, I will do these things and actually I'll follow up with the group um, either next presentation or, or at the next meeting where we actually summarize the results of the test or, um, or as a separate follow-up. So I'll take these questions to heart. Um, <laughs> uh, the question is a contingency plan if production is zero at the first injection rate of five prints per So production rate likely will be zero at the injection rate of five barrels per minute because we're not gonna build pressure enough. I think all the models show we won't start seeing any outflow or production until we get well into the further steps, until pressure builds up. Now, we chose to have these pressure, back pressure on 16B for two reasons. And the one is our, 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 our thermal hydro or the mechanical models look to be, um, the, the mechanical models for the pluralistic effect, if we don't, if we allow the pressure to, to fully just bleed off and the flow to come directly out of of 16B, we essentially, we don't get enough pressure to support aperture there. We get a lot of weird, very high gradients and we don't get much flow out of 16B. By keeping a little bit of back pressure on the well, we allow a little bit of inflation there by a poor elastic effect to support some of the aperture. The second part is 
um, at these at these temperatures, um, you know, I showed the fluid coming into the well being in the order of 220 degrees C. We will have a lot of heat exchange with the casing and as, as the fluid flows out. But at these pressures, uh, at that temperature, if we take it straight to the, the surface with no back pressure, we'll be flashing the steam in the well. We're trying to avoid that so we can produce single phase water. So um, the back pressure will have a big effect here. And so at that back pressure, I, at pumping at a half a barrel a minute loop, we won't see outflow by in, in any of our predictions. We won't see outflow at that flow rate. Um, I'm going to stop reading these and, and, and I'll come to these and just talk to them. We can just talk back and forth. I think we're going to get, we're getting, I'm getting a little bit too off track, but um, we'll talk about this. Um, we can just talk about it after I go through these slides. Um, so we looked at some of these things here. So this, and, and if I, I task a colleagues are on the call, I'll let them answer questions of these directly themselves. But um, essentially the same scenario with pumping 80% of the fluid in the first stage and 10 and 10 in the others. Um, this flow rate schedule here is a little bit different than what I just showed, but um, it's a similar behavior that we see. Um, so um, we are working to actually, they're, they're, I'll have all these things in one consistent set of slides and units, um, but what you're looking at here from the Excite model results are on the top here, we're looking at different fracture potential apertures based on some of those permeabilities. Um, we're looking at... Um, uh, Pressure histories over the different clusters and um, uh, do, 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 do flow rate histories that come out of the fluid. So these units are in cubic meter per second and, and megapascals. I'm not going to talk to the pressures other than we see a very similar trend between all the simulations. Um, once I get these all into the same units, I'll present them all together. And we have actually, we do have the same, the same scenario modeled um, with the, um, with the Falcon code. So we'll be able to do these, a direct comparison between the two. Um, same data here, different aperture. Um, what am I looking at here? Um, I'm gonna move on. I'm actually, I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna stop sharing. Well, I'll keep sharing here, but I'll go to my, my landing slide and I'll try to answer some of those questions that came up here. So, um, Eric, well, we could talk about apertures. I'll, I'll let you talk to Branco about that. Um, uh, Luke, if you just want to come off mute and um, ask your questions here, keep me from having to read them. Okay. Yeah, so um, uh, feel free to tell me <laughs> when okay, you don't yeah, want ahead. me to stop talking. Yeah. But um, you know, just one thing that comes to mind, you know, doing these step constant flow rate testing, it does make a lot of sense logically to start at a low rate and then increase your way up. In my experience, a lot of times I have to make that first injection really, really long because the rate's so low in order to see production. And that can help make sure you're getting good data the whole time. But um, I have more success in the lab when I start at a high rate and then ramp down versus the opposite. So I just thought I'd share that if it's helpful at all. Okay. Um, you know, we, we, we've gone through, a, I'd say, scenarios ad nauseum for, for ways to approach this. And I, I think we've always taken the approach of the abundance of caution at, at, at the foresight. So, we'll, you know, we'll be monitoring pressure. And there was a question earlier in the chat about how often what the, the sampling frequency will be. For the patient, they, I believe the patient system runs at one hertz. Um, so at one sample per second. We, we have plans to run the forward system at um, uh, one sample every 10 seconds. And it'll push to the web about once a minute, um, just because of all the communication protocols. Now, as I said, we take always take an abundance of caution in our approach. So starting with the lower rate, we could watch at least the pressure interference. We could see the pressure build. Um, and the, the, the concerns are, you know, trying to stay below frac pressures um, and, 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 and that effect. So I didn't come up with those numbers, but the, the, the reservoir engineering team um, feels pretty strongly, as do I, that, you know, we, we don't want to be trying to create any new fractures. Whether we will or not, I think I, I think we won't because we'll have enough pressure sinks in the system. But um, you know, th that's where those things came from and where the steps largely go higher and higher. And we can see uh, the pressure. Now, in some of that initial shut-in in 16B, we will be able to watch that pressure and look at the pressure between the two wells until that, you know, until we get enough pressure until we start allowing flow to come out. Um, 
And our hope is that we can actually have flow outflow at different pressures, at, at different injection rates with the same essentially back pressure on 16V. So we could look at the delta P between the wells at different flow rates coming in and then also look at the flow rates coming out. There's a whole lot's going on here. Um, there's a whole lot of different objectives for this very first test, but the primary objective is to just demonstrate connection between the wells. If we do that, we'll consider the test success. All these other things we've been adding on is to try to squeeze as much science out of the test as possible. Um, the follow-on tests will, will be a little bit more constrained um, uh, and, and try to get very more specific purposes out of each one. Hopefully that you know, answers questions. Um, question for Joe, you, know, you can read that yourself. Uh, July 4th is the last estimate I had, um, Jonathan, was there about, was right about July 4th. Thanks a lot, really appreciate it. Yeah. Well, course, what yeah. was the question? Sorry, I missed that. The question was just what's the current best guess for the uh, beginning of the casing run? Um, yeah, it's probably going to slip to 8th or 9th of July is the number I got late last night. Okay. Gotcha. That sounds great. Thanks. And, and, and unfortunately, all these dates are a sliding, very, you know, sliding scale. We like, you know, hopefully you have more than a day's notice, but it's just, there's so many uncontrollable um, variables in this that it's impossible to say. So other questions or comments? Side remarks? I think it's a very exciting time. Um, I'm looking forward to see these tests uh, for me as a mass, heat and mass transfer kind of guy. It's, it's, it's um, very exciting. Can you be the depth of the casing shoe in 16B? Um, say that question again, please. The depth of the casing shoe in 16B? Uh, I think we were looking at 10, 1, 97, give or take a few feet. Yeah, thereabouts. But 10, 1, between 10, 1 and 10, 2 measure depth. There are plans to perforate the casing in various locations or? No. No, Not initially, yeah. At 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 this uh, juncture, uh, the goal is to see if we have connections based on on the fibers that are in the hole. Um, we're anticipating a stimulation come, let's say December January timeframe, which would be a full scale stimulation that um, will pump into sixteen A. We'll look for hits on sixteen B. And then, then perforate 16B based on that. I see. Thank you. Yeah, and take that a little further. So, you know, um, after we get done with all this testing, we all get ready to move off the hole. The last thing that's going to happen is either a plug or a um, whatever. They're going to place something at the bottom of, of the. Casing. It'll be a copper head placed in the casing oh, yeah. and left yeah. there. So we'll place a copper head in the casing of, of 16B right below the shoe, right at near the shoe. And um, essentially then that we'll actually have that well. We're, we're also working with um, with Devon to use some of their proprietary techniques for pressure interference inside a sealed casing, as well as using the strain gauges for when that next stimulation event occurs. Um, so we'll have multiple ways to monitor in 16B to look for where these hits might come through and how well they come through when the stimulation happens the next stimulation activity in 16A. Um, question here about um, uh, pressure still goes up at high injection rates, shows there's not adequate hydraulic connectivity through the profit pack. Um, so I would say we really don't even have a profit pack in, in these wells. Um, there was some fluid injection or there was some micro profit um, injected mostly as an a indirect tracer to see if we could pick it up in the, in the production well when they core through it. But um, we don't have a, a, a true profit pack in here. So it's gonna be, there, there has been some shear. I mean, we know there's been some shear. We know there's been stimulation of the, uh, of the fractures in, in 16A. Um, how far that, uh, I, I didn't mention this, but the Geos Energy Swiss um, uh, folks, when they did some of the deep, more detailed analysis of those slug tests, they did find an interesting fit where they could show a, a uh, a spherical solution to the data out to a distance of approximately, I believe, between 50 and 75 meters. And then it was more of a, uh, 
a radio solution after that. So they interpreted that as being there's a fairly well connected zone between 50 and 75 meters away from uh, 16A, and then just a few discrete fractures or intact reservoir outside of that. Um, and so if that's the case, we'll, you know, we'll see what those pressure signatures look like. Um, Luke Frash, uh, I'm reading your comment here again. I know my, my glass is back on. Okay, we got your point taken. Um, I think we're too far down the road to make that change now, but we may be able to look at it for the, the follow-on tests um, for the second or third test. Um, another question here for Joe from David Allenbaugh. Joe, I'll let you look at it yourself. Um, this is, um, that, that's still open. Yeah, I see you're talking about 78B, which is the um, it's a monitoring well, case to 8,500 feet. Um, there, there seems to be a ledge just, just below casing. Um, we haven't decided what to do about that, that ledge. Um, and will that, and, and so that, that's questionable what we'll do about that right now. The, the other thing, actually, it's an interesting observation. I'm going to point it out here, is that when we were set up our monitoring system, the, the depth to water in some of the wells was deeper than we expected. And so some of the cables we had um, to lower the transducers in the well weren't long enough. So when we filled, we were out there, we actually ended up filling all of the monitoring wells up with water to near the top and then placed our, our uh, the pressure transducers in there to get all the offset wells. And very interestingly, the Two wells, that 78B and wells that did not have a stimulation treatment, um, we filled them with water. The water level essentially went to that level we filled it at, and it's been stable um, ever since. Or if it's declined, it's been less than maybe a tenth of a PSI over the last month. But in 5832 um, and in 16A, both of those wells, we fill them up, the water essentially drains down, you know, and, I believe it was like, you know, in the first hour is more than 80 or 90 feet. So both the wells that had a stimulation treatment show rapid uh, the formation taking fluid. And the wells that did not do not show the formation taking fluid. That That's just, you know, an anecdotal observation, but it, it might be it might be informative as we think that the, the effectiveness of these stimulation treatments. And I just wanted to mention that as I thought it was a pretty interesting observation. Um, I didn't show any of the data from those wells, but we'll, we'll, we'll uh, We'll have all those things up and online here, um, hopefully really soon. So if there's no further questions, we can close for the day, um, but I'll leave it open here for another minute or two if anyone has any closing thoughts or comments. I thank you for your time today. Have a great rest of your day, very exciting time, and be, look, be on the lookout for social media drops from Forge as we start doing some of these tests. Thank you all. So Rob, can you share that um, PowerPoint with I me? Can. I'll